Before we turn to God's word, would you please join me as we turn to him again in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the stillness of this moment, would you help us by removing the distractions from our minds and hearts so that we may be focused on what you are saying to us tonight in your word. Father, we know that such topics can, can stir memories and old wounds. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us sensitivity and humility. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight and would be a blessing to your people. Be with each of us this night, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 14 through 21. And it looks like if, that, if you're looking in the Pew Bible, that is found on page 966. This evening I'll be reading from the ESV version of the Bible, and if I'm not mistaken, that's the version that is used here at North Blendon. So if you have if it down, sounds a little funny, it's probably because it's a different version, but we bow our heads and hearts together as we hear these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. Hear God's word as it speaks to your heart this night. The Apostle Paul writes, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The grass withers and the flowers fade. The word of the Lord will stand forever. When a ministerial candidate is examined to become a minister of the word and sacrament, they're examined on their personal walk with the Lord, their doctrinal beliefs, their, their understanding of the Bible. They're examined on the content and their ability to preach a sermon. The examinations are often rigorous and personal, and rightfully so. Because if someone is going to be given the charge to, to shepherd God's people, to, to cultivate their faith in Him, if they're going to be held accountable on the day of judgment, well then, for his and the congregation's sake, it is necessary and wise to hold a thorough examination. But one area that is sadly missed in the entire examination of a candidate is their philosophy and practice of counseling, which is much of the work that is made up in the pastor's weekly duties between Monday and Saturday. And this evening, amongst us here tonight, there may be varying preconceived notions about a, what, what counseling should be and how it should be done. But for, for the sake of this evening, the, the working definition we're going to have is that counseling is at its core the shepherding and the discipling aspects of the pastor's calling. But as we read in Matthew 28, not only are pastors called to go and make disciples, that is a call that is placed on all believers' hearts and lives. And so this is not just a working definition for Pastor Aaron or for those who are ordained. It's our ministry as well. And so it's important for us to see how it's an integral part of our calling and an integral part of the life of a church. 
When I sensed my own calling into ministry, I pursued a counseling background because I had witnessed what a pastor does Monday through Saturday what those countless counseling meetings often look like. And so I went to Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. And I earned a Master of Arts in Marriage and Family Therapy and Counseling. And from my time in, in Mississippi, fulfilling my clinical hour requirements, I'd like to share with you three stories that will help us hopefully, by the grace of God, understand Christian counseling a little bit better. And just by way of disclaimer, for sake of confidentiality, all the details and names have been changed. So story number one. Jennifer was a 17-year-old young woman who was struggling with bulimia, an eating disorder, and depression. The 5'7 teenager had dropped down to an emaciated, or an emaciated 95 pounds. Jennifer and her family attended a local church. She was active in soccer and on the cheer team. So if you're the counselor, what do you say to her? As she struggles, as she's embarrassed, as she feels ashamed. Do you say this? Well, what's causing this bulimia and depression is nothing more than a lack of faith. If you just had more faith in Christ and recognized that you were made in the image of God, well, then you wouldn't struggle with an eating disorder. In fact, if you must have made beauty and physical appearance an idol, and you must repent of this sin as well. Is that what you would say? Would that be your go-to? Is that the first words out of your mouth in that circumstance? I would hope not. But sadly, that is what passes a lot for Christian counseling. What have we done to that young girl? We've amplified her guilt and shame, and not only that, now we've questioned her faith in the Lord. If you went to the doctor and they took an x-ray and they showed that it was a broken bone and it needed to be set and put in a cast, and the doctor says, well, I don't have time to set it right. I'm just going to wrap it in a hard cast and we'll take it off in six weeks. What would happen to your arm? It wouldn't be better off. You'd have more problems and more harm would be done. So too with that type of Christian counseling. Story number two. Jake was a 40, or excuse me, a 24-year-old young man who recently had graduated from college. There he met his fiancée, Becky. They were planning on getting married in the spring, and for all intents and purposes, life seemed to be going well. But Jake visited with tears in his eyes and said he wasn't sure if he could go forward with a wedding because he was struggling with same-sex attraction. Becky had no idea that he was struggling this way, and in fact, no one really did. On one hand, Jake loved Becky. He wanted to marry her. But there was this other side of him. He knew what the scripture said about engaging in homosexual lifestyle. He, he wanted to live a life that honored the Lord, and yet he had this struggle. So what was he to do? Does Christian counseling say this? Well, you know what? At the end of the day, God just wants you to be happy. However you may define your happiness, that is what you should pursue. Because ultimately what God wants is for you to be happy. Is that Christian counseling? Sadly, that is also what passes for Christian counseling this day. Does moving the goalposts help someone essentially by saying, well, you know what? God's word may not fit into your feelings and desires. So it can be changed, ignored, or not applied to you individually. Would that work in the medical field? If, let's say, you went to the doctor and you had blood work done and it showed that your white blood cell counts were extremely high, which is an indicator possibly of cancer. If the doctor said, well, you know what? This is what your results say, but you're really not going to want chemotherapy. You're going to be tired. You'll probably get sick. You're not going to be able to engage in the regular activities that you're used to. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to expand the parameters of what we consider healthy white blood cell counts. So now when we look at the chart now, well, it says you don't have cancer. You have nothing to worry about. Does changing the parameters help or harm a person? My hope is that we can all see that it would harm someone very much. Story number three. 
Susan was a 49-year-old woman who struggled with alcoholism. And because of her addiction, she not only lost a multitude of jobs, she also lost many of her family members who were tired of dealing with her and changed their numbers and didn't give her the new one. As Christian counseling say that alcoholism is just a demon inside you, that alcohol is a sin, and that you just need to pray that the demon would be released or do we simply say to her, just stop it. Just put the bottle down. Don't pick it up. It's just that easy. Is that what we say? Is it that easy? Of all of these stories, we've seen examples of what passes for Christian counseling. And in each we see not only are they ineffective, but sadly, they can do more harm than good. So what does the Bible teach us about what actual Christian counseling is? Paul helps answer this question as we see what Christian counseling is and what Christian counseling is not. How many of us here wear glasses or corrective lenses, contact lenses or something? My guess is that many of us do. And the reason for that is because without those corrective lenses, we would not be able to see things clearly. We would not be able to see things as they truly are. But what you and I must understand this evening is that idea also applies to our understanding of the world around us. We need the right lenses in order to see things clearly and as they truly are. And the lenses that we need are the scriptures themselves. God's word being inspired by the Holy Spirit without error as well as authoritative over our lives must be the bedrock of our understanding of everything else in this world. The scriptures themselves allow us to see things as they truly are. They give us the moral compass. They teach us how to live. The scriptures teach us the difference between this is the way that it is and this is the way it ought to be. You see, if the scriptures are not our lenses and authority, then something or someone else will be. Whether it's our feelings, our desires, another philosophy or another world religion, something will fill that gap. What's the first thing that the scriptures teach us? About our God. Our God who is all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing, holy, good, righteous, and gracious. A God who reigns and rules over heaven and earth. You see, if there is no God, then again, something or someone else will fulfill that gap in our lives that gives us the purpose for our living. But the scriptures also reveal us, ourselves, clearly. From the opening chapters of Genesis, we see that you and I are made in the image of God, and by that alone, we have immense value and worth that cannot be taken away. At the same time, the Bible teaches us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That the tentacles of sin reach into every facet of our lives, and so not only do we sin, but we are sinned against, and we live in a fallen and sinful world, all of which affect the way we think, feel, desire, what motivates us, what we believe, what we trust, every aspect of us is affected. And so another difference between genuine Christian counseling and everything else is whether or not we believe we are inherently good or inherently sinful. And that is so crucial to the healing process because if we believe that we're inherently good, then that means that the problem doesn't start here. The problem is out there, and it's out there that needs to change, and I'm just fine the way I am. But if I believe what the scriptures say and I realize that, that I'm fallen, that I'm broken, that I've been wounded and hurt as well by sin, then that means the problem is not only out there, it's also in here. And I need a, a source of healing that comes from outside this world. I need a savior from outside this world and outside myself. You see, the secular world, and even sometimes in the Christian world, we like to label things as sinful. As was given as an example earlier, we like to label, some like to label at least, alcohol as sinful. Alcohol 
in and of itself is not sinful. Alcohol in and of itself is an inanimate object that does not have any morality attached to it. However, what we do with it can be sinful. See, the problem isn't with the alcohol, it's with us. Another difference is found with whether or not we deal with just the symptoms or the true cause. You may hear my voice, it sounds a little scratchy. If I were to go to the doctor and I were to ask him or her for a, for a cough suppressant, I could go and I could have that symptom dealt with. But that doesn't mean that I've ever dealt with the actual cause of that cough in the first place. So too often it happens in counseling. I feel depressed and so we want something that will relieve that symptom of depression without actually dealing with what may be causing that depression in the first place. We all too easily are satisfied with simply having the symptoms dealt with. Another difference is in what are our ultimate objectives. Do we want just behavioral modification or heart transformation? Do we want the goal to simply be, well, I can behave better. This aspect of my life may seem better. Or do I realize that, that I need to be a new creation, as Paul wrote in our text, that I need to be fundamentally changed from the inside out, and I can't do that on my own, and so I need the power of Christ through his spirit working in my heart to bring about that transformation. The second is, is your objective happiness or holiness? For most counseling, what is prized above everything else is happiness as the ultimate goal. And the definition of happiness, though, is subject to the desires of each individual person's heart. But if holiness is our ultimate desire, and holiness is defined as being shaped all the more into the image of Christ, well, then we have an objective measure found in God's Word. And what we ultimately find, then, is that it's through the pursuit of holiness that we then find true happiness. Paul wrote in our text, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. The reality is true healing, true restoration, true reconciliation, true transformation can only come through the cross of Jesus Christ. There are no detours around it. And what does Paul write concerning those who have experienced the power of the cross? That transforming power of Christ in their lives. Who've, who've not only been discipled, but are now called to be disciple makers. That God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a king or a president or a leader and speaks on behalf of and represents the king. You and I are called to be ambassadors in this world, speaking on behalf of and representing the king of kings and lord of lords. So what does that practically look like? Well, holding that biblical perspective in mind where we have the scriptures as our lens, and we have a biblical view of God, ourselves, of sin and healing. One of the first aspects is that we listen. We listen. This is probably one of the most underrated characteristics in our society, to genuinely listen. See, we not only listen with our ears, but with our eyes, with our body, language, our tone, our posture. You're talking to me and I'm on my phone 
If you're talking to me and I'm doing something else, what am I communicating to you? You're probably not all that important to me, or at the very least, what you're saying isn't all that important to me. So listening, number one. Number two, we suspend judgment. Now this is crucial when it comes to discipling and counseling. Now that doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge right and wrong. Of course we do. But we do suspend it for a moment so that we can learn more about what is truly going on in the other person's life. If we're quick to say, well, that's wrong, that's a sin, and it very well could be, what's going to happen to that person? How are they going to respond to that? More than likely, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to, one, they're going to shut down and the conversation's over, or two, they're going to get defensive and say, oh, yeah, well, you, and then the subject's been changed, and the opportunity to love them and serve them and disciple them is lost. Number three, we build trust. I don't share what I am told unnecessarily with other people. Why is that so important? Because if people don't believe that they can trust you, they're not going to tell you the whole story. They're only going to be comfortable telling you what they're comfortable with everyone else knowing about. That is, if they tell you anything at all. And again, the opportunity to speak the gospel into another person's heart is then lost. If trust is lost. Fourth, we ask, we ask questions. We have to peel back the onion, if you will, to get to the core issue of what's going on in their hearts and lives. And we must be careful that our questions are not leading or negative or judgmental in tone or in word. And so that means we must have a genuine curiosity and care for that person. Imagine if you could an entire library with books from the floor to the ceiling. And you walk in there and think that each book is a different sin. Why is it that the person that you are engaging with, that you are loving, that is engaged in perhaps some unhealthy decisions in their life, are going to that particular book? Of all of them in the library, why are they choosing that one? What, what is that sin promising to give them so they keep going to it? There's a reason why they're going to that sin. Of all of the things in the world, why do they choose that one? Fifth, we're compassionate. And so we don't say things like, I know how you feel. It may sound nice, but we don't always know how other people feel. Saying things like, can you help me understand how you feel? Serve a whole lot better. And finally, six, we speak the truth in love. By helping them see and understand that whatever they've been tricked into believing that that particular sin, that particular book on the shelf will give them can actually be found in Christ alone. See, that's how sin works. And it's been working that way ever since our first parents in the garden. Sin makes a promise to your heart and says, you know, I know what you need and I'll give it to you. You don't have to go that way. I'll give it to you this way. It'll be so much better, so much sweeter. It's important that we know why they choose the book that they do so that we know all the more how to uniquely apply the gospel to their heart, how to bring them to the cross. See, sin is not sin simply because it's wrong and evil. It is those things. But sin is sin because it pulls us away from God. It robs us of that perfect, beautiful, intimate, loving relationship that we were always designed to have with him. And so when we disciple, we disciple with the mindset in mind to not just be a police officer who writes them a ticket before their sin, but as one who is seeking to reintroduce them back to their heavenly father. So let's apply this type of counseling, this type of true biblical counseling to the stories we've heard in the beginning of our time. To the 17-year-old young woman named Jennifer, after listening to her story, after asking questions about her life, we learned that she we wondered why she believed that being a certain size is what defined her beauty and her acceptance and worth. 
And what came to light is that throughout her life, her dad only complimented her based on her looks. Sweetheart, you look so pretty today. It was the main thing she heard from him. And so from a very early age, she learned that she was accepted, she was loved if she was pretty. She also grew up hearing her mom constantly criticize herself about her, her dress size and her looks. Jennifer thought that her mom was beautiful. She, she held her mom in high regard, and so she began to think, well, if mom views herself in that way, how does she view me? Well, Jennifer broke her ankle in soccer practice. She wasn't working out as much as she was before because of the broken ankle. She began to gain a little weight, not much, not anything abnormal. But something clicked. I'm a little bit bigger than I was before. Am I still going to be pretty in dad's eyes? Is mom going to be as critical of me as she is of herself? She got anxious. She got depressed because she couldn't work out as she used to through soccer and cheer. I'll take care of it. And the eating disorder soon followed. You see, when we suspend the judgment, when we actually listen, when we hear the heart, we could not only bring Jennifer to the cross, we were able to bring her parents also so that each and every one of them could find their identity and value in Christ. For 24-year-old Jake, who was struggling with same-sex attraction, after suspending judgment and after showing genuine compassion, For someone who is hurting and confused and alone. Turns out that Jake grew up in a single parent home without a father. And his football coach had an inappropriate contact with him after practice. And this went on for a number of years. For Jake, his coach was like a father figure to him. How could someone in such a position do something that would be harmful? Jake was confused and manipulated into thinking that that which was actually evil and harmful was maybe a form of fatherly love. You see, Jake hungered for a fatherly relationship. And through this form of abuse, Jake had been conditioned to believe that this is where he could find it. So over much time, Jake began to see that these struggles were something that he could bring to his heavenly father who loved him not selfishly but selflessly. He was able to share this with his fiance Becky who was a wonderful Christian young woman. By the grace of God he experienced these desires subsiding and they were able to move forward with their wedding. Well what about Susan? We had to peel back many layers to Susan's alcoholism. Turned out when she was 19, she was a freshman in college. She went to a party. Things went too far physically with a young man and she found that she was pregnant. Fearing that she would disappoint her parents and not wanting to lose her scholarship, she had an abortion. Though she finished her degree, Susan never could shake the immense guilt and shame that she carried. Whenever she thought about the night of that party, whenever she thought about the the coldness of that abortion clinic, whenever that day came on the calendar, the opposite of the birthday of what would would now be her 49-year-old child, the day that he was aborted or she was aborted, she couldn't keep the feelings of guilt and shame at bay anymore. She drank, hoping and praying that those feelings would go away. It wasn't until we got to the core of her heart, peeled back the onion, that we could bring her then to the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. And for the first time, the desire for alcohol began very slowly to fade. 
None of these stories were an overnight success. None of them were not without their own setbacks. They all required much time and trust. These issues in our lives don't start overnight and they are not quickly remedied. And what we must remember is that if we take away someone's crutch, we must be willing to walk with them to teach them how to walk again. And so true biblical counseling is ultimately about discipleship. It's ultimately about walking with them and showing them how to walk with Christ. It is about shepherding a broken but redeemed heart. And so counseling then is the application of the gospel to every facet of life that has been touched by sin. And so Christian counseling often begins when the gospel is faithfully preached from a pulpit. The gospel is rightly taught and we learn about who God is and who we are and what sin is and the implications. And we also hear about the healing that comes by God's grace. Then sometimes those things that have lied dormant for a long time, those things that we may have forgotten, those things that we have sought to suppress, come bubbling up. And so what we must realize is that there is hurt in every heart. There is pain in every pew. And even though we may see smiles and singing, we do not know all that is going on in a person's heart and life. If we look beyond the smiles and the singing, we will often find people who are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and even at times physically bloodied, bruised, and broken on any given Sunday. So when you and I meet together in worship, it requires a level of compassion and kindness as we bring them to the cross and not to condemnation. Where we deal not just with symptoms, but we deal with our need for a savior. Where we don't justify sin, but find the sinner justified by the blood in, found in Christ alone. Where we find the application of grace, not guilt. The old adage is, is that a, a church should be a hospital for sinners, right? Not a museum of saints. And that is why as a congregation, we must be very cautious when referring our brothers and sisters to counseling. Because theology matters, doesn't it? If we don't have a view of God, of sin, of ourselves, of what can truly bring about healing, then we risk doing more harm than good. And so will you, in your friendships, apply the healing balm of grace in this way? Will you pray for your pastor as he seeks to shepherd and love people who at any given moment are at various different places in their life and their walk with the Lord, who may be taking the first baby steps, who may have stumbled and fallen? Will you pray for him? Will you pray for your elders? And even this night, will you receive the gospel of grace? I don't know you. Well, I know Carol. We work together. But I don't know what wounds are in your heart. I'm not going to stand up here and presume to know everything you've gone through. But I do know my heart. And I know that I am in a sinner in need of a savior. And I know you are too. So will you respond to the gospel of grace as well? And hear your heavenly father calling you home to him who says, I see your wounds. I see your scars. Come here. Will you receive the healing balm of grace applied to your heart through the working of, your, of the spirit tonight? May each of us this night respond to the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son who invites us to bring every aspect of our lives to him. The good, the bad, the ugly, 
the wounds, the scars, the shame, the guilt, to experience the healing, forgiving, transforming, restoring, reconciling power of grace. Father, I trust that there are those here tonight who have reflected upon their own lives and their own hearts have been stirred. Perhaps they see wounds and scars that have lied dormant for a while, perhaps that have been pushed down and ignored. Would you help us bring the healing balm of the gospel to such wounds? And when we're not able to apply it to ourselves, will you provide loving shepherds and dear friends who will help us to understand your love all the more? Father, we confess that at times our good intention counsel may have done more harm than good. Please forgive us of that. Would you help us to fulfill the calling to be ambassadors of reconciliation to a world that is in need of a savior, to a world that belongs to our king? It's in Jesus' name we pray these things together. Amen.